<laughs> okay, good. Um, so there's this proposal to make uh, Advent seven weeks. And uh, the interesting thing to me about the proposal is that it doesn't really require much change. It doesn't require any change of the readings. For example, this morning's readings and this morning's sermon and the, the songs that we sang at 830, that was all Advent because it's about the return of the Lord Jesus at the end of time. Oh, yeah. And one of the things that I learned when I did the presentation for the Eve Circle was that no one knew that that was one of the themes of Advent. Because, and I think the reason is, it's usually the Sunday after Thanksgiving is just one Sunday. And we don't connect it with the pre three previous Sundays because the end of the Pentecost season, the last three Sundays are always about the return of the Lord Jesus at the end of time. And one of the things I don't say in this presentation specifically, so I'll say it now, is we're dealing with three introductions in Advent or three comings of Christ. There's his coming at return at the end of time. That's the first Sunday of the traditional Advent. Then the second and third Sundays of Advent are about John the Baptist, who announces the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And it's only the fourth Sunday that's about Christmas. Um, and in the process of doing this presentation, one of the things, preparing this presentation, one of the things I realized is that Christmas is actually an interruption in the liturgical calendar, and we probably would be better off without it. So I'll start I'll with that. that. I, have a, I have a big question, though. But Are you going to have to make all these? Advent wreaths with more candles. Well, I think that's one of the questions. <clears throat> of, you know, those are the practical issues of how do you deal with this. We'll we'll get to that. If, I'd just like to jump ahead. Yeah. Okay. If, if um, Lent is the preparation, there's a three part season, and then Easter, and then the preparation for Pentecost, which is just one Sunday. The seventh Sunday, with where Christ has ascended, so we're preparing for Pentecost. Then Christmas is Advent, Christmas, and Epiphany. It's a three-part. Except that Christmas is really an interruption in the Advent Epiphany thing, and I'll get to that. So one of the things that I've realized in doing this is we currently have a two-week Advent. It's the first Sunday, the second Sunday, and by the third Sunday, we're already. The first Sunday is overshadowed by, by Thanksgiving. The second Sunday, we actually have John the Baptist. Um, and so this is the first Sunday, though, is overshadowed by Thanksgiving generally, although this year it won't be, because this year, Christ the King Sunday is the Sunday after Thanksgiving. Easter was late. Right. Well, no, it has to do girl. it has to do with when Christmas falls on um Monday. So then you actually have four Sundays of Advent in December. That's what it is that we don't. And Thanksgiving is the earliest. It is the earliest it can be because it's the 23rd, is it? 23rd yeah, this year? Yeah. So the, but the texts on the first Sunday of Advent are about the return, the Lord's return at the end of time. And they're continuous with the previous three Sundays. Then the second Sunday, we always have John the Baptist introduced. And the, why am I going back? There we go. And then the third Sunday is supposed to be about John the Baptist preaching, but it's hijacked by the Christmas pageant. So we actually only have two Sundays of Advent. By the third Sunday, we always have the Christmas pageant. Yeah. And I know from my 50 years as a pastor, they're trying to have the Christmas pageant on the fourth Sunday of Advent yeah. is a fool's errand. <laughs> I mean, it's a nice idea. It would make a lot more sense, but you get all these practical concerns. Well, people are away. They aren't going to wait that long. You know, it just, it doesn't happen. And so... It's because Rudolph was on December 2nd. Well, well or <laughs> the day after Labor Day. The stores are decorated now the day I after Labor Day. Can't. So, 
So we effectively have a two Sunday Advent. So there's the first Sunday and the second Sunday, and by the third Sunday, we're already at the Christmas pageant. And then the fourth Sunday, this year it's Christmas Eve. Um, and since the first Sunday is actually, the fourth Sunday is actually about Christmas, you know, that's okay. But it creates its own problems because we expect we're only going to have one service that morning. There'll be one good service idea. of Advent that's 4. Well, because the I was thinking yeah. like, you know, people are going to say, well, I'm going to the five o'clock, so I don't need to go in the morning. Right. right. That's right. So Advent effectively will end on the second Sunday of December, and that's true every year. And it isn't only here. Um, what is on the screen? Okay, it's better than what I have in front of me. He said the table is down. Starting with the second Sunday in November, the Bible readings are thematically similar to the first Sunday of Advent. So today we had the parable of the prepared and unprepared bridesmaids. And the, uh, the preferred hymn of the day for that text is Wake Awake, for Night is Flying, because the texts of the hymn are drawn directly from this parable. Uh, greet the bridegroom. And then the next Sunday, we have the parable of the talents, another parable about being prepared for the coming of God's reign. And then the final Sunday of November and the church year is the festival of Christ the King. And the gospel reading is about the final judgment, another early Advent theme. Um, the proposal for a seven-week Advent of the liturgical scholars, they would eliminate They'd keep the text and eliminate the name of the festival. This was a new festival, uh, I think, in the 1940s, 30s, right? Was maybe it was the 30s, but it was a response to totalitarianism in Italy and and Germany. Uh, that you know, only Christ is king; nobody else is 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 our king. Um, so we wouldn't have to change any of the existing Sunday readings to go to a seven-week Advent. We have some practical details that have to be worked out creatively. You know, pillar candles could be added to a wreath to make seven, or candles are only lighted on four of the Sundays. I mean, there, there are ways to work work this out. I, I mean, sometimes all the candles could be lighted by the time we get to the Sunday of the Christmas pageant, for example. And then we don't light any more after that. I, it's it's um, there are lots of ways to work that out. And the other thing it does, though, is it makes the Sundays after All Saints more meaningful by connecting them to Advent. I mean, the <laughs> culture the culture is preparing for Christmas before Thanksgiving even. So only twenty minutes late. If we if we started Advent like this Sunday, we'd be in, more in sync with what's going on in the culture than we are currently. By by holding off, it just it just doesn't really work because um, Christmas has just gradually crept um, earlier and earlier. The other thing we're contending with, of course, is that the secular celebration of Christmas has nothing to do with the birth of Christ. Um, it, you know, it's all it's become about shopping and gifts, and not not about um, the incarnation, God taking on human form in Jesus. Um, so, some background. Advent was originally a six or seven week season of preparation for baptisms on Epiphany. So, a kind of parallel blend um, yeah. with Easter. And Epiphany was originally the church's celebration of the coming of Christ into the world and the celebration of the incarnation. It was a celebration of Jesus' baptism as well, his baptism by John, and the beginning of his ministry which <clears throat> the season of Epiphany is still a celebration of the beginning of Jesus' ministry. 
But what <laughs> happened was that when these two lectionaries, the Roman and the Gallican, which was the Western European liturgical calendar, when they were merged, basically Christmas was inserted into the old season of Advent, and I would say destroyed it. Um, the Romans had this Saturnalia um, celebration, which was a celebration of the birth of the God. So essentially what the Christians in Rome did was they took over that Roman celebration, and I maintain we'd be better off without it, but good luck with that. Um, because, all, you know, the Eastern Church does not have Christmas. They have Epiphany. And they call that their Christmas, but they they preserve the old calendar of having a longer season of pre preparation for Epiphany. And Epiphany is the big deal because it's the revealing of the Son of God in, in his glory and the beginning of his ministry, which is really the point. So... What happened, though, when they merged these calendars, Advent was shortened to four weeks, and I'm not, I don't understand why, but it orphaned these last three Sundays of the church year that are have the same theme as the first Sunday of Advent at the end of the Pentecost season. So that's, and this happened, I think, in the eighth century or something, these two were merged. My history about these literature, I know where to look to get the answers, but I, I'm, I'm not real. I'm not an expert on uh, the history of liturgy. So <clears throat> when I did this with the Eve Circle, this first one was a revelation, they told me, that the return of the Lord at the end of time in Advent, really? Yes, that's the first Sunday in Advent but also the last three Sundays of the season of Pentecost. And the other thing that came up was, well, why do we even bother with that? Well, <clears throat> this is a basic Christian theme. And for those of us whose lives are very good, we, um, we maybe have more trouble with this. We're not looking forward to the Lord's return. No, we're not. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if we lived in Ukraine, or if we lived in some places in South America, we would feel quite differently. Um, it's one of the reasons why um, Pentecostal churches have grown around the world. The people who are in desperate situations, that sense of the um, apocalyptic that, you know, the world's going to end and the Lord's going to return uh, what we had in today's second lesson, um, there'll be the cry of command, the trumpet will sound, and the Lord will descend, and we will meet the Lord in the air. I mean, people are looking forward to that when their lives are bad. A traditional Advent um, prayer response is, come Lord Jesus, come quickly, but we would our response, I think, would be, come Lord Jesus, but not chicken. Yeah. Um, which is why I don't use it. And the, maybe we should, but we haven't used it. Um, and then, you know, the second two Sundays are about John the Baptist and his preaching. And only the last Sunday of Advent is actually related to Jesus' birth. Which is why, to me, when I did this presentation really thought about this stuff and Christmas is just an interruption in what should be a smooth transition from um, from these last Sundays of Pentecost to Epiphany. Uh, I already said this. Yeah, Diane's asking. Yeah, go ahead. I've got the Sunday where the very big deal is the Mary getting told that she's going to have a baby. That's the last Sunday of Advent. Yeah. I mean, that's well, that's Matthew. I mean, one of the things we're contending with is, you know, Matthew has a brief story about Jesus' birth. Luke has an extensive one. John and Mark have nothing right. about Jesus' birth. And so the Eastern Church 
doesn't dwell on that. You know, in the Eastern Church, the emphasis is really more on the resurrection, and um, and the Epiphany is more is more. How can I put this? And in Eastern Church, there's a greater emphasis on mystery, and Epiphany fits well with that. Uh, or you could say that their liturgy is formed more by these festivals that have to do with Jesus' glory and less about his humanity. Um, it's the Western church that was much more focused on Jesus' humanity. Like in the Eastern church, you don't have crosses with a bloody um, corpus on them like you do in Spain and Italy and so on. There, there they would have a Jesus, who's the reigning, is still with Jesus. That you would kiss a lot. Well, that might be. Well, they they're into icons, but the icons have a stylized Jesus, who's a ruler, rather than so much the crucifixion. It isn't the same kind of emphasis that we have in the West. Um. So, <clears throat> there's one one big problem. What I see, and it's when we go to a nursing home, we can't sing Christmas carols past the first stanza without reading the words. Without what? Reading it without seeing. Oh, the yeah. Text. Well, some of us can. <laughs> oh, yes. yes. But you have a hard time teaching an entire congregation Christmas carols when you sing them once a year and only three or four of them on Christmas Eve when people come to church. I don't mind having 17 Sundays of Advent, but I was always ticked off at the end of time because it's, it's Advent start. You want to call it Advent right after All Saints? That's fine. The first four Sundays are about the end of the world and coming of salvation. But there ought to be some time where we go to church and just sing Christmas carols that tell the story of Jesus' birth, religious ones, not Rudolph. And that can happen for more than one week or more yeah, than know, one but... evening. Yeah, but that's that's if you bring up the nursing tradition. home thing, you know, one of the things we have to deal with is that most of the churches are not liturgical. And so the hymns that people know are some of the ones we sang, we tend to sing at funerals. You know, they know Amazing Grace. They may know When Peace Like a River. They're not, they're never going to, the Sunday hymns that we sing, the typical ones, it's just not, we're, none of those are repeated often enough that everybody's going to know them. We went to a Judy Collins concert on Friday night, mm -hmm. something I wouldn't recommend. She's 84 and she's <laughs> forgetful. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't my idea. My, my well-meaning son thinking, you know, oh, this, yeah. this was somebody who was important to dad 60 years ago. <laughs> I mean, I saw her perform for the first time 55 yeah. years ago, you know. I thought that this was a good idea and you know we ended up singing amazing grace she you know because that was There's one of her thing. signature things way back when and the group could sing the first stanza but when she wanted to do the second one she had to line it out you know it was great you know tell people what the words were now some of us know it but mm -hmm. but i don't think I don't think that's a realistic expectation. I'm just saying people like to sing. Christmas well, they do, but yes. they only know the first and we don't stanza, sing and there's, so there's we, nothing wrong with that. Why don't we sing? We should be singing them through Epiphany, at least. We should. So we should have three Christmas. Three, yeah, we don't. Three we don't sing enough Christmas, Christmas songs during. In, in some Advent, we sing some songs that are. Not the typical like Christmas songs. Or at least wants to play them. The other thing that we're dealing with is we have great Advent hymns. And among Lutherans, we do. I, I huh? said that we, we do. Yes, yeah. we do. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> we yeah. do. We haven't been hearing those. <laughs> right. Well, that's too bad. Yeah. Fling wide the door. Fling wide the door. Fling wide the door. Um, Low Hour Rose. Low Hour Rose. Two. Although that one's a green blade rises. Yeah. Green blade but, rises. You know, wake awake. Yes. A lot of them, though, are, are Norwegian and Swedish. 
the and is and finish. No, <laughs> I'm just saying no <laughs> it says something about our background because <clears throat> Advent was especially important in the northern. Um, when it was lands. dark all day long. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Because you were waiting for the light. Yeah. Um, it's so interesting to me that it was a seven week thing, and I get it because you know the the Lent one, uh, the uh, you know what I mean. The, parable. the similarity between Lent and Advent yes. that makes sense. I'm just wondering when they came up with the four candle Advent wreath. I wonder if there ever was a seven candle Advent wreath. No, <laughs> was there an Advent wreath back then? No. Or no, so. that was yeah, a more modern so invention. Yeah. So. That was a more modern invention. Yeah, I don't know exactly so. when, That's but you don't remember. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. you sound like my kids. People do it to me. To I'm sure it. they do. I'm sure they do. Um, <laughs> but but you know that's again that's a practical thing. It's just like the change in the color of Advent. I wore my blue suit today because I was going to talk about Advent. Um, <laughs> the fact that the color changed, you know, it had been it had been purple, and then yeah. in the with the new liturgical calendar in seventy eight, the recommendation was that you use blue in Advent because it's not the same as, as Lent. It it's a different emphasis than Lent. But back to your thing, Diane, what you just mentioned. I, right now, it's difficult. <laughs> Again, this is a problem with Christmas. For us to do like preparation of, for baptism, have a baptismal festival on the floor. Well, we have one scheduled for the Sunday after Epiphany. But because of Christmas getting yeah. in the way, you can't really yeah. do the whole preparation time like you can in Lent. And so what happens is you know, we're trying to be more serious about preparing people for uh, membership in the congregation because most of them have little background in the church. And you, what ends up happening is the only time you can really do it is in the winter and through Lent and have the baptism sometime at Easter or right after Easter, because with the Christmas as an interruption, you can't, <laughs> you can't easily do it in the fall and do something like even during Advent, before Christmas. It's like, we're just finding this out. We're trying to do it, but it's like, it's like pulling teeth. The because thing that would bother me the most is we have these really beautiful banners that Lisa Clark yeah. and Roy, oh, yeah. the blue banners, yeah. and it's yeah. like, you know, there's like one candle, and then there's two candles, and, yeah, we, and Lisa has moved, and we're not going to get her to embroider <laughs> three yeah. more banners. It, it would just Break my heart to not have those banners up. We have to come up with a workaround for that. Well, you can use them. I don't, there's no no reason why you can't use them. I mean, I, George, yeah. Have you ever considered doing an Easter vigil? We years ago when Martin yeah. was pastor, we did that. Did you? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Saint Thomas has an Easter vigil. But right. I will go to with my daughter. And they have baptisms then, which is kind yes. of oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the ancient. That's, it's the ancient practice. Practice. Yeah. We're we're going to do something this year, yeah. I think. I we're not so, going to do a full blown Easter vigil. Yeah, it's a long we're, worship, right? Long we're worship. we're probably going to do something. We just haven't decided mm -hmm. what. Well, I remember the Easter vigil when Hal Douglas was pastor, and there were so many candles that it set off the smoke alarms. And it oh, I'm God. kind of glad this is happening because nobody believed me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we, 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 really? we detracted somewhat from the spiritual nature of the service. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I did that once. I did that once at a church. I did it in the Zion. Four candles. Yeah. We. I had to do it when I was four. Oh my god! And I couldn't even reach it, so my dad helped me. Oh, oh, there's there's a lot of I, dads do. Yes. I think that this is actually my last slide. Um, you know, the point for me is to maintain Advent as an independent season of the liturgical year, and really that that emphasizing that first theme, the return of the Lord Jesus, is really important. It's always been important. In, in the church. I mean, the, the Bible's uh, 
I'm going to use this word, essentially an eschatological document, which means looking toward the future. It's not about the past. It's about the future and us being drawn into God's future. And what, which includes judgment on much of the present, and um, which is why this theme is so important, but it gets, it gets lost at the end of the Pentecost season and the beginning of Advent. Um, I, I have to say that for those of us, <clears throat> preachers often struggle with this theme because it can be a lot of bad news. Um, you know, Keith did a really good job with it this in the sermon this morning. And, um, but you can end up saying the same thing over and over again if you're not careful. And that's especially true in the year of Matthew. And my, <clears throat> my dislike of preaching on Matthew is well known. So I don't have to talk about that. Uh, you didn't, you just like a, a you talk uh, preaching on Matthew. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah well, I don't that's like well that. known. Yes. All right. So if we're, we're doing this Pauline study Seven. and eschatology is defined as God's great cleanup of the world now. Yes. It's not about by and by heaven and all that stuff, but it's. You know, and so right. So Jesus' passion isn't Mel D Mel Douglas of Mel. What's his name? Or Gibson. 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 Mel Gibson's yeah. Jesus' passion is his blood on the cross. Jesus' passion is for justice. Jesus' passion is for equality. And so, if you get those themes into those Sundays of the year, then it becomes an exciting festival. Although, otherwise, it's just gloom and doom. It's going to end in chaos, and Jesus will come, but we won't be around to enjoy it. Yes, but there's also the the other side of that, which is <laughs> the theme about justice and so on can also be offensive. You know, Hallelujah! I mean, I why, would Jesus, why would Jesus come? If he, why would Jesus have? Passion? I know, but I'm just saying. I mean, that's one of the challenges for preachers. Like, yeah. But, but so I'll think... go with. I mean, I'll go with seven Sundays. If you're, you're already annexing the second, the last two. And you're just taking off Christ the King, so we already have seven. Is we do effectively, yes. We have them. Oh, yeah. I didn't know it was yep. George. I'm so sorry. We were late because we wanted to support the Boy Scouts too. Oh, so did you did you have breakfast? So we did. Okay. So we went up and we spent some time, you know, with those children. Because you know I can't resist being there for the children. But um right. I just dropped money a, in the box. <laughs> is this a general movement in, in the church now, or is this something that Upper Dublin Lutheran Church is doing? Well, if we do it, it's us. I mean, there's a it, it's a talk among liturgical scholars. Um, so how long that's going to take for it to get? It, it'd be it's individual congregations that would be doing it. And there are other congregations. There are other hours. congregations that are doing this. And yeah. so, so this is a, a this is a conversation that's taking place outside of like a synodical gathering. Yes. Or... Yes. Synodical gatherings are not about liturgy they're much more boring and i think there are more um <laughs> episcopal and anglican churches that are looking into it that have started it. Yeah. Oh, yeah basically yeah. yeah and 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 some lutheran churches with pastors who are involved in liturgical discussions yeah. But I, I think, I mean, we get so bogged down and, oh, well, now we're going to need seven candles instead of four. I mean, that's no big deal. You can do that. Um, but why, I think yeah. the, what we need to focus on is why are we doing it? And if we're looking at these last three Sundays of Pentecost and end times and the second coming of Christ, but we, we really do need to, we can't, I think, I think we have such a focus already on, oh, we need to be good so we get to heaven and we don't end up in hell. I mean, there's so much preaching like that, especially in Pentecostal churches and a lot of old time preaching was like that. And we, we miss the John the Baptist preaching where, you know, repent, meaning turn your life around, be transformed. Right. And that coming of Jesus into our lives and how are we making this kingdom on earth now, not just waiting to die and enjoy the kingdom. 
Okay. That really is something we should be talking about all year round, isn't it? Though? Well, yeah. it is. But yeah. each big yeah. advent gives you, you know, you have those three themes. Yeah. It's not just about baby Jesus. You know, it's about end times and current times. How is Jesus coming into your life now? Looking at John the Baptist and the ministry of, you know, looking. Yeah, I, I think we'd do well to <clears throat> annex. I don't like to lose Christ the King because that's kind of the end of the year. But maybe we could end the year on All Saints Day and combine All Saints and Christ the King. I, I was taking uh, it was part of a group of people that got sent out to Chicago in my early days to the community of Christ the Servant, which is a, a church that gathered malcontents of all the churches in the suburban Chicago area and met in a barn. It's a good way to describe had a, it. Had a, had a church and they, they wrote a book. But on Christ the King Sunday, they closed the church. They said, Christ the King, church is over. We're done. You're on the choir. You're on a committee. Everything finishes. Come back and add them. And then the next Sunday, they had this parchment on the altar. And you went up and you signed up for the year. If you wanted to join the choir or do all those things, you just, you did that. But there was an idea that <clears throat> you didn't have to do something forever. And that a new year had begun and you would make a pledge for the new year. And by signing that, you were making your commitment to the church. And that commitment would end in 12 months. It and wasn't only up. about what you were going to do. It huh? was about membership in right, right, the right. community. Yeah. And, that and, you were and, signing was, and you got to re-up every year. Yeah. So you made a decision that you were going to accept Christ's call for ministry in that place. And that was an important thing. And it got me thinking about the end of things. I used to dismiss the dismiss the choir on Christ the King Sunday. They all came back the next week, but it gave them a sense that it wasn't a lifelong sentence. <laughs> and if that happened on All Saints Sunday, where we also acknowledge Christ coming in glory at right. the end of time, then we got our dead relatives that we're praying for acknowledged to be part of God's great cleanup and God's rescue of the world. And then you can get into Advent and do all the rest of the services, but with the theme of uh, of renewal and starting fresh in a new a new direction. I think though, I think for me, really, the point of this is that it makes <clears throat> there is a clean break after All Saints yeah. that we're starting something different. And right now, it's not clean; it's just right. messy. We're More sort of yeah. the Pentecost season kind of peters out, and then. We sort we start up Advent and we only have two weeks of it and then we're into Christmas. You know, it's it's like we've let the we let the culture just well, <clears throat> so one of the principles in the church that you have to keep in mind is there are only 20% of the things that affect us in the church that we have any control over. 80% has to do with the culture. And it's hopeless to try to change them. And <clears throat> that's <laughs> As one who early in his ministry really tried to preserve Advent as a time, I quickly learned that good luck with that, you know? Um, well, we're not going to decorate it. No, <clears throat> you have to decorate during Advent. You can use blue bows instead of red ones to keep it Advent-y, but you need to start to decorate. You need to start to put some candles out and so on, because otherwise... You're just like the Grinch that stole Christmas, and you're out of sync with what's going on. It's going to be really hard if December 24th being a Sunday, we normally don't put up Christmas trees until Christmas Eve. Like we, well, they might be sitting there, but they're not decorated. They're going to be. So, <laughs> I can so assure I'm, you that they will I be. You already said this, but I'm having such a hard time having it having it get through. So Advent is really about that other coming of Jesus mm -hmm. that in your future nobody around here really wants to have happen now because that's right what it's what Advent is really so about. that okay well I never knew that I honestly yeah. never knew that I well, see, and this is, Advent was the birth of the Messiah yay yeah, he's yeah. born and and Diane that's what I learned by doing this presentation with the Eve circle <laughs> was that that was nobody no one knew no None Except the person that lived there. Yeah. 
right? Yeah. Well, they knew. I think, I think we, we did talk some about that when we did Jack and Ia years and years ago, because somehow or another I was aware of it. I'm not sure how I became no, aware of it. Jack and Ia, we really remember. So I don't know, but I'm just, I'm, I don't yeah. know when I became aware of it. Maybe it was way back when I was in Lutheran school as a kid. Um, well, I can tell you, if it percolated through, it percolated yeah, right yeah. And this is like a whole new way to mm. think about it. We don't we certainly don't teach children about the second well, coming of Jesus during Advent. Yeah. They talk about Jesus yeah. being born right. more yeah. than Jesus returning. You know, Diane, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it would not be very popular. Hi, this is the Sunday we're gonna talk about the end of the world and well, we do it during the end time. But we're doing but, it for three weeks anyway. Well, but then we, you know, in Pentecostal the churches, are we, they uh, do. Yes. Changing, yeah. I'm sorry, but when I hear "Come, Lord Jesus," I do not hear "Come, Lord Jesus" up there, and all the good souls get to go up and be with you. I hear "Come, Lord Jesus, be born in the manger." Right. That's what I hear, and well, that's what I think most people yeah. hear. You're probably right. Yeah, you're probably right. So yeah. now you've really screwed up my advent. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. Well, so I think I was successful. <laughs> George, is there any is there any talk about having midweek Advent worship? I no. I always no. love no. that because it's just it's not the hustle day. bustle of getting ready for Christmas. Mm -hmm. It was like this is your time to just set aside and focus on what Advent is really all about. And that that's something I think that families would benefit from. Well, we've had enough of a struggle having something during Lent, you know. Advent would be something that could be looked at right. in the future. I well, mean, right. last year was the first year we had midweek Lent for well, in a few years, but we but the, traditionally this church has had midweek. Yeah, well, I know for a long that, time. Mm -hmm. but yeah. was that, but yeah. it had died, and it was yeah. just resurrected last year. So. Yeah. Uh, George, I've heard people um, reference Little Christmas. Is that from the Eastern that's, Yes, term? that's Epiphany. Yeah, that's what I thought. But I, What's funny about that is it, it was the big Christmas. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, the whole the 12 days of Christmas, mm -hmm. that's, that's from right. the 25th yeah. to the 6th of right. January, which is, which is Epiphany. Mm -hmm. But that that's a Western look way of looking at Epiphany, which is to say, well, it's a little Christmas. Well, no, it was it was originally the celebration of the baptism of Jesus <clears throat> and his revealing as the Son of God. That's what the Epiphany season was about, was that Jesus um, manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him, as it says in the Gospels after all these stories where he is preaching and teaching and healing. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting how in the, because of our celebration of Christmas, that Epiphany turned into a wise man festival. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. Which again, that's a, in some, one of the interesting things about it's Lutherans, are you yeah. but, but isn't that the, the wise man, isn't it the revelation of Christ to the world? Well, so I was just going it, there. I was just going there. One of the unusual things about Lutherans is that we've made the Epiphany season uh, about missions because of the wise men. It's the revealing of Christ to the nations. You know, not just not just Jews like himself, but to other people. And so the wise men, you know, represent that and. Garrison Keeler has a wonderful story about that. Um, about, you know, since the wise men were from other countries, you know, one of them might have been Lutheran. And and myrrh was actually a casserole, you know, <laughs> which was a Midwestern mashup of the word hamburger. Uh, you know, we would describe what was in the casserole. And, you know, it's, she, <clears throat> his wife said to him, so you're going, they had a baby. So they're here, take this, but bring back the dish. <laughs> um, which you know all sounds a little silly but but it also makes the point that among lutherans in particular epiphany was really about missions and about christ being revealed to the nations of the world and 
our involvement, the importance of our involvement in that. Um, we give our finest gifts. Right. As the wise men brought their finest gifts right. to Christ. But this so, is unusual. We are the only church body that did that with you. Um, yeah. So, well, I probably need to go get ready for the next service. Yeah, we should go to that pancake breakfast. All right. We're going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.